Hello and welcome to this video on running principal components analysis in R. So principal components analysis is a really useful tool when you have a data set which is multi-dimensional, which has um, lots of variables perhaps measured about each individual subject. And you want to find whether um, different subjects uh, separate from each other, perhaps based on all of these variables. As humans, we're only very good at looking at um, two, maybe sometimes three variables um, at one time. Uh, in a plot, for example, we, we tend to um, have no more than um, two different axes. But often we have data where we have many more variables than this, and it's quite difficult for us to be able to um, see the patterns in the data and see whether there are, for example, clusters um, of our subjects. So principal components analysis allows us to create linear combinations of our original variables, which explain away as much variance in our data as possible. And so we end up perhaps going from maybe 10, 12, 30, or even more variables uh, down to just two or three, which uh, explain most of the variation in our data and allow us to look for uh, patterns. So for this video, we're going to load the iris data set, which if you've watched any of our other videos you've seen before, it's quite a famous data set in R. And we're going to load this with the data command and provide iris as the only argument. And that's loaded our data. And just to remind yourself of what this data frame looks like, if we look at head iris to look at the first six subjects, then we see we have a data frame with five variables, four continuous variables, um, sepal length and width, petal length and width. And these are uh, continuous variables. And we have um, one variable called species, which is a categorical uh, variable which contains the names of uh, the different species of iris flower. And if we just have a little look at summary, we can see that we've got three different species, um, Satosa, Versicola, and Virginica. Now often when you've got the kind of data that you, you might think about running a principal components analysis on, you may not have um, this annotation of uh, different groups of individuals. You may just have, for example, the um, continuous variables. And so you're using principal components analysis, uh, analysis to see whether um, your subjects separate into distinct groups. I should also mention at this point that principal components analysis can only accept continuous variables. So if you have categorical variables, um, vehicle versus drug treated, for example, you're not able to include these in the model. So pretending that we, we don't know that our data frame is split into two, in, into three iris species, we're going to build a principal components model, um, which will hopefully reduce our four continuous variables um, into just uh, two principal components, which capture most of the variability in our data and allow us to see any patterns. Um, and we're hoping perhaps that um, once we've constructed our principal components, they will allow us to see whether we have any um, clusters of observation in our data. So running PCA in R is very, very simple. We're going to call the output of the PCA model my PR for my principal components, and then the assignment operator. And then the function for constructing principal components is PR for principal and comp for components. And then we simply supply the, um, uh, the data that we want it to construct. And then we simply supply the um, columns of data that we want to use to construct our principal components. So for us, these will be the iris data frame. We want to use all of the observations and we want to include all of the um, continuous variables in our model. So the petal length, sample width, etc. Uh, I mean, we want to exclude the species column. So the easiest way to, to, to do that, well, there are two ways we could do it. We could either do one colon four to select columns one through four, or we can say all of the columns except number five. What happens if we have a data frame which has um, in which we, there are just select columns that we want to use to construct our principal components. So we can do that instead. I'll just do it on a new line by saying that we want to pr uh, construct our principal components by se sepal length and 
petal width, say, and the data is equal to iris. And so you can supply it like that. Um, seeing as we want um, all of the columns up to number five, or except number five, uh, we can simply supply the, the columns like this. Now, principal components is very sensitive to differences in scale between the variables that you use to construct your principal components. So what I mean is that if you, in your, in your data frame, say you have measurements, um, say ridiculously, perhaps we measured sepal length in millimeters, which I think they actually are measured in, and we measured sepal width in kilometers. Obviously, the, the absolute numerical values of the sepal width variable are going to be uh, much, much higher than those for sepal length. And so in our final principal components model, sepal width will appear much, 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 much more important than sepal length for no other reason simply than because the um, scales of our variables were vastly different. Um, of course, in this case, they're not, but in a real world example, they may well be. And so there's this additional argument which we're going to supply to the PR comp function, which is scale, and this is equal to true. And now by default, this is false. So what does this argument do? So instead of supplying the original variables to the PR comp function, by supplying this scale equals true argument, instead we supply these variables once they've been centered and scaled. So what I mean by that is, to, so to center a variable is to subtract uh, the mean so that uh, the new mean becomes zero. And to scale means to divide by the standard deviation. Um, and I can illustrate exactly what that means. So let's plot sepal length against sepal width. So we can see our data here. And now if instead we scale these variables and plot them, so let's copy and paste that. Let's wrap each column in this scale function. So this will center and scale the variables. Can you see that the only thing that changed in our plot are the um, x and y axis scales? So if I flip flop uh, between the two, you can say that the, da the, the data points stay exactly where they are and the values of the axis change. And so when, once we scale um, the sepal width variable, center and scale, sorry, um, the centering basically means that the mean of the original variable is uh, zero. And the scale, so dividing by the standard deviation, means now that a single um, unit is a standard deviation change. So this is one standard deviation, this is two, this is three. And the same thing for our sepal length variable. So the mean is now zero. This is minus one standard deviation, minus two standard deviation. Now there are two benefits to doing this. Firstly, that the scale of our variables is no longer important and no longer has um, an influence on our resulting principal components. Um, so it no longer matters if one of them is measured in kilometers and the other one is measured in millimeters. And the second important thing that's happened is that the relation, or, or that hasn't happened rather, is that the, the relationship between our two variables hasn't changed. It's stayed exactly the same. So if you scale and center all of the variables that you enter into your principal components model, the relationship between them will stay the same. Now in our situation, we perhaps didn't need to scale our variables as they're all measured in millimeters but there is really no downside to scaling your, your variables. And so I, I would tend to um, always scale my variables uh, before I enter them into a PCA. So let's build our PCA because I, I don't think we ran this code. And let's have a look at the result that we get when we call the PCA object. So our output shows us um, uh, a section for standard deviations and a section for rotations. We'll interpret these standard deviations in a second. For the time being, let's just look at the rotations. So you can see that we've got, um, uh, so our original variables, our, our original scaled variables, um, have been combined to form um, four linear combinations, four principal components. And actually you'll, you'll usually find that um, you'll end up with one less um, principal component than you have variables that you originally enter. 
However, principal component one is um, perhaps the most important, which explains most of the variability in your data, followed by principal component two, which explains the second highest amount, and principal component three, etc. And now you can see that within each principal component, we have a value for each variable that we entered. And these are our eigenvectors. Um, these are the values by which our um, original variables are multiplied by to um, calculate uh, the principal component score for any one uh, particular observation. So, for example, if a, a particular observation had um, a, a, a sample length of uh, 2, then um, 2 times 0 0.52 plus whatever the sepal width was times 0.26, plus whatever the petal length was times 0.58, plus whatever the petal width is times 0.56, would give you the uh, principal component score for that individual observation. So this is how we get the linear combination of our original variables to form um, our principal components. We get a little bit more information if we call the summary function on the principal component object. And so you can see that for each of our principal components, we have three values, um, a standard deviation, a proportion of variance, and uh, the cumulative proportion. So the standard deviation is the standard deviation of the data along a single principal component, so a measure of the, the, the variability uh, across that principal component. The proportion of variance is the proportion of the very all of the variability in the um, original data, explained away by the uh, by this principal component. So for example, 73% of the variance um, in the data is explained by principal component one, 23% is explained by principal component two, 3.7% by number three, and 0.5% explained by number four. The cumulative proportion is sort of what it sounds like. So um, again, if we take principal component one, um, this explains 73% of the variability in the data. If we take together principal component 1 and 2, then 96% of the variability uh, of the data is explained. Um, if we take 1, 2, and 3, 99.5%. And if we take all four, this explains 100% uh, of the variability in our data. We can represent this in something called a scree plot. So if we call the uh, plot function on my PR, and then say the type is equal to L for line, then we get a plot which shows the variances um, across each principal component. So of course the variance is the square of the standard deviation. Um, and so that you can see that by the time we've taken into account um, the first and second principal components, um, most of the variability in our data has been accounted for. Now to actually interpret our principal components, we can use a function called byplot and supply our principal components object and an additional argument called scale equals zero, which we'll see in a second just makes the um, axes um, a little bit more interpretable. And so the plot that we get is looks a little bit confusing, but basically each number is an observation from our data frame. So observation, so point number one is the first observation, um, etc. And each observation is plotted with its values for principal component one and principal component two. And then these red arrows they represent the eigenvectors for each variable in our data frame. So the way that we interpret this is that generally, as um, an observation has a higher value for principal component one, it has a lower sepal width and higher petal length, petal width, and sepal length. Alternatively, as an observation has a higher value for principal component two, generally it will have a lower sepal width, um, a slightly lower sepal length, and no real difference between petal length and petal width. So this plot helps us interpret um, the importance or the relationship between the different variables and the principal components, um, but it's not a very pretty way of, um, of representing or looking for the patterns in our data um, after we've projected our data onto the new uh, principal components. And so instead, what we can do is extract the principal components, uh, at least number one and number two, because they are the most important, um, attach those to our data frame, and then uh, plot these using uh, ggplot. So if we examine the structure, 
of our um, principal component object, we get an output like this. And if you're not so familiar with this yet, don't worry too much. But basically what this is telling us is that our principal component object, my PR, has values for uh, called um, sdev, um, rotation, uh, center, scale, and x. And these values of x are the principal component scores for um, each observation. And so if we run call my PR dollar sign and X, then for every observation um, in our data frame, we get the um, score on principal component one, two, three, and four. And so basically what these are, are the coordinates. So for example, observation number one, is uh, found at um, minus 2.5 and um, minus 0.478, so um, around here somewhere. And now what we want to do is take the principal component scores for um, PC1 and PC2 and um, attach them to our iris data frame so that we can uh, plot them a bit more nicely. Uh, and the way that we can do this is by creating, um, let's create a new data frame called iris2. And we're going to use this command called cbind, which stands for column bind. And we're going to provide the iris data frame. And we're going to provide the uh, principal components, number one and two. So what this does is takes our iris data frame and the um, first two principal components. Uh, sorry, the first two uh, principal component scores and uh, binds them both together, sticks them together. So if we have a look at the oops, the head of iris2, you can see that as long, uh, along with our original variables, we also have the values for each observation uh, along principal component 1 and principal component 2. And now we can use these to create a plot. If you haven't yet um, looked at the, uh, or, or are not familiar with the ggplot uh, plotting system, um, don't worry so much um, with this section. Um, I, I would recommend that you look at the tutorial um, that I've produced already to uh, hopefully understand the, the, the code that we're about to produce. Um, but it's not particularly complicated. So we're going to call, uh, oh, sorry, let's, um, uh, if you haven't already installed ggplot, install it with this command. I'm not going to run this because I already have it installed. And once you've installed it, we can load the functions into memory. Oops, I forgot to say it's ggplot2. Um, load ggplot into our memory. So we do this with the ggplot function and we supply iris2 as our data frame. We supply the aesthetic mappings um, with the AES function, and on the X axis, we want to map PC1, and on the Y, PC2, and then we want to map color to species. So remember I said before that um, often, if you're running a PCA, you don't necessarily know group membership um, uh, be be beforehand, and you're, you're using it as a tool to identify perhaps groupings or, um, or clusters of, of data. Um, but in this example, seeing as we do know the species identity of each individual data point, we might as well um, color our data by species to see how well uh, the PCA has managed to separate them. So we're going to map species to both color and fill. And we'll see why in a second. And on top of that, we're going to layer um, uh, a job which we haven't, uh, we have, we didn't encounter yet in the um, ggplot um, tutorial. Um, it's actually called stat ellipse, and we want this to be. Um, so, so uh, um, often you'll see people that publish principal component um, data or plots, and will have their, their data points, and then will. Um, uh, show a 95% confidence uh, ellipse, which should sort of um, demarcates the, the the data and shows the 95% confidence um, uh, interval for um, a, a two-dimensional um, collection of data. We'll, we'll we'll see what that means in a second. Um, we're going to supply the argument that the JOM is equal to 
a polygon because we want this to be a uh, an ellipse which has an outer line and um, a, a shaded in area as well. Um, the line we want to be black and the alpha, the transparency to be 0.5. And then on top of this, we're going to layer John Point. Uh, we want the shape to be 21 and the color, the outer line to be black. And so if we run this, we get a nice plot that looks like this. And so now each data point in our original data set is plotted based on its um, coordinates awarded by uh, principal component one and principal component two. And so we can see that starting with four original variables and just condensing them down into uh, two linear combinations of those variables has um, been able to separate um, our uh, three different iris species, well at least separate Setosa um, quite considerably from Versicolor and Virginica. And the Versicolor and Virginica species are sort of half separated. Um, we, we can see that they're more similar to each other than um, either of them is to uh, Setosa. And you can see that by layering on top this stat ellipse um, polygon John, um, then we've uh, layered on top a 95% confidence ellipse which as well as um, sort of uh, being a, a representation of the variability of the data also helps demarcate by eye uh, sort of where the majority of the points for each group lie. And one final thing before we finish, um, I said earlier that we can use this by plot to interpret the relationship between um, each um, uh, variable in our original data set and the principal uh, component. Um, another um, way statistically that we can do this is by looking at the correlations between our original variables and the principal components as a way of helping us interpret um, how um, as one principal component changes whether our variables go up or down and by how much. So we can do this by looking at the correlations between variables and principal components. We can do this using the correlation function, COR, and to this we're going to supply the um, iris data frame with um, everything except um, species. So, sorry, let's remind ourselves that we have these five variables and that if I, if we call this, we're selecting all the rows and all the columns except number five. And we want to know the correlation between these, our original variables, and the um, principal components. So this would be one, two, three, four, five, um, columns six and seven of iris two. And if we run this, we get the correlations between um, each of our variables and the principal component. And so we can interpret this as um, the, so, so these are um, Pearson correlation coefficients as you'd interpret if you're doing any other kind of correlation. So the correlation um, between sepal length and principal component one is large and positive, um, just shy of 0 0.9, which means that generally as the value for an observation um, increases along principal component one, so does its sepal length. Alternatively, for sepal width, we have a, a, a moderate negative correlation uh, between sepal width and, and principal component one, so that as principal component one increases, generally sepal width decreases, um, and, and so on um, with um, petal length and petal width, with which both have uh, very strong positive correlations. For principal component two, everything seems to be negative. So we have a moderate neg negative correlation between sepal length and principal component two. So as PC2 increases, sepal length decreases. Um, an even stronger negative correlation between sepal width and principal component two. So that as principal component two increases, sepal width um, decreases sharply. And although we have negative correlation coefficients for petal length and petal width, these are um, quite small. Um, and so there, there's uh, perhaps no real relationship um, between um, uh, principal component two and these two variables. And actually, if we look back at the biplot that we had um, a second ago, 
we can interpret these in the context of this as well. So again, looking at principal component one, we have positive correlations for sepal length, petal length, and petal width, and a negative correlation coefficient for sepal width. So this is this column. And for principal component two, all of them are negative. So you can see that all of these arrows are going down to some degree. And the largest negative is with sepal width. And the next largest is with sepal length, which is here. And then and the correlation between petal length and width and PC2 are both sort of negligible because these lines are almost horizontal. And so that's principal components in R, um, which is quite simple, it's quite nice, um, a good way of um, looking for patterns and groupings in your data. Um, and a useful ne next step after performing principal components analysis is to apply um, cluster analysis to um, the, your, um, your data projected onto the principal components. So again, in this example, we already know um, the, um, the uh, group memberships of each of our observations. But if we didn't, we could apply a, class, a, a cluster analysis um, algorithm to our data to sort of um, try and automatically sort and categorize um, each data point into um, uh, its own, uh, it, into a cluster. Uh, and so we'll explore that in another video. So play around with your data, um, have a go at performing principal components, um, and also have a play around with this scale um, argument here. Um, perform principal components using scale and um, without scaling and centering your, your variables and see if that makes a difference to the uh, outcome. If you find it doesn't make a very big difference, um, change the unit of one of your variables, perhaps by a factor of 10 or 100, and see how that changes. Um, so that's all. I'll see you in the next video.